Good morning again, Your Honor. Everyone needs a safe place in their life. I don't feel safe anywhere. I'm going to ask my parents to go to the doctors tomorrow or Tuesday again. This time I will tell them about the voices. I only told them about the people I saw. Like I'm mentally and physically dying. Over the weekend, I actually felt warm for once. I woke up from a good dream. I said to myself, why can't everything freeze right here? I had just hoped everything could have ended there and not a second longer. I feel like I'm in a time loop of sadness. I will forever not feel the love of another human being and not even I can love myself as I hate myself probably more than some people already do. I barely made it through ninth grade mentally as my depression was rough. Then I made it to 10th grade and I have fully lost control. How the hell am I supposed to make it two more years when I'm already at my breaking point? Those are Ethan's words. Ethan was at his breaking point and no one stepped in. Ethan had quit the bowling team. He had quit his job. He was failing almost every single subject. He sat alone at lunch. His only and trusted friend left. His dog died. He was hallucinating. He was hearing voices. He was depressed. He was suicidal. He was anxious. He was writing on a paper in the middle of class, surrounded by his peers. The thoughts won't stop. Help me. The world is dead. My life is useless. The prosecutor is right. He didn't come out and tell the counselor his plan. But did he have to? Wasn't it glaringly obvious? This was the third instance in 24 hours. He was looking up bullets. He was watching a video of a shooting and now writing in actual words that he's hallucinating and needs help. And again, Ethan was overlooked. Ethan, in his own way, crying out for help, still went unnoticed. If there was a question about who cared about him, it was settled in the counselor's office. He sat there. His parents didn't greet him or touch him or act at all concerned and said, actually, we have to go to work. We can't do this right now. There was no question at that point that no one cared about him. Those are not my words. Those are the words of the prosecutor at the preliminary exam of James and Jennifer Crumbly. As a human, you want to try to rationalize things that happen, especially bad things, things against the norm, things that are unfathomable. You can't do that here because the thoughts put on paper in the journal the words found in the text messages and the video, they are not rational. They are the ramblings and thoughts of someone gravely mentally ill. So as hard as we try to rationalize it, we are not able to. I wanna talk about the violence project. You have that in your binder as exhibit B. Ms. McDonald touched on that as well. It's a report that was prepared at the request of the prosecutor's office in the parents case. Dr. Jillian Peterson testified in a Daubert hearing after examining much of the same evidence that you've been presented with here today. In that report, she states that the road to violence is a long, slow build over time with the perpetrators providing numerous warning signs to people around them. The intervention needed to stop a mass shooting is often simple. A human connection, providing hope, seeing someone else's pain. She says that there is a common misconception by the public that mass shooters are evil monsters who just simply snap and commit a shooting. She goes on to explain the steps on the pathway to violence. She says in step one, child abuse, exposure to violence, chaotic and unstable home, mental health concerns. Step two, identifiable crisis point in the days, weeks, or months before their violence. Shooters communicate their crisis to others in noticeable ways, changes in appearance or behavior, or leakage of their plan to others. A final blow can be a major loss, failing a class, rejection from peers, paranoia that becomes unbearable. Step three, shooters are almost always angry and lonely, and many fixate on a group that they can blame for their circumstances. It is common to blame school, peers, and motivated by a desire to make sure that they're going to make headlines so that they're known forever. Step four, 
shooters have access to firearms and to the people that represent their grievances. She found that what is unique in this case is the role that the parents played in enabling him along the pathway to violence and ignoring his requests for help. Again, this doesn't rationalize his behavior, but it gives it context. So when the prosecutor stands up here to argue that the crime itself was so horrible that a life without parole sentence is proportionate, I argue that the very report that they had created argues against that. The people's witnesses that they called were only fact witnesses. They provided no expert opinion in their case in chief that our Ethan is irreparably corrupt, no expert opinion that he cannot be rehabilitated, no expert opinion to say that his brain was fully developed, no testimony to show that his childhood was ideal. Nothing about what the witnesses testified to goes to the analysis that is required with the Miller factors. If we were here just to discuss the horrible facts of that day, we would be here for a trial. Ethan pled guilty. The court can see through the exhibits that are contained in the binder and the testimony that was presented exactly what type of family and home environment that Ethan had. This was a home with constant fighting, yelling, accusations of affairs, money troubles. This was a home filled with alcohol. Ethan was left home alone beginning from a very early age. We heard from multiple neighbors, and you can see it in the text with his mother when he's only 10 years old, begging his mom to come home. He was left to cope with his fears himself, so he turned to violent video games, violent movies, and violent websites. In looking at the third factor, effect that familial pressures may have had, Ethan repeatedly talks about the lack of money, the fact that he is a burden to his parents, his father's employment status, the fact that they can't afford college. We even saw in the text messages, mom wasn't even willing to pay any longer for braces. Ethan asked his parents for psychiatric help and didn't get it. He told his mother about the ghosts and the demons, the voices. The issue of Ethan's mental illness is shown in the conversations as early as 2020. And you can see those between the conversations between James and Jennifer. They're also shown in the conversations between Ethan and his juvenile friend, in the writings of his journal. What he Googled after receiving no help from his parents, he was trying to diagnose himself. Ethan did not have the support that he needed. It was glaringly obvious that he was not okay. His parents took a disturbed, mentally challenged, and possibly ill kid, their son, and what did they do? They didn't take him to a doctor. They didn't take him home. They didn't walk into that room and say, I love you. I'll do anything for you. What's wrong? They didn't embrace him. You know what they did? They bought him a weapon. Again, not my words the words of the prosecutor in the case of the parents. I think that Ethan's parents' reaction to hearing of a school shooting says it all. As hundreds of parents drove way above the speed limit to make sure that their child was still alive, we found out what his parents did. His dad went directly home to look for a gun, and his mom texted him, don't do it. They knew he was in a crisis. All of the evidence presented as to his home life should be considered, and we argue clearly shows that the second factor, family and home environment, should be a mitigating factor. When it was our turn to call witnesses, we first called Dr. Romanowski. He was the expert in corrections, who didn't review the facts of the case, as that's not his expertise. His testimony goes to the heart of the fifth Miller factor, possibility of rehabilitation. Not whether he has already been rehabilitated, or if it is with 100% certainty that he can be, whether it is possible. He examined all the records from the Oakland County Jail. The purpose of his testimony was a look forward after the day of rest, arrest, not back. He has extensive knowledge of what happens after someone is placed in jail and when they're transferred to the Michigan Department of Corrections. He testified that Ethan had no major misconducts and has only a few minor misconducts. He explained the process that Ethan will go through. He'll be sent to the Thumb Correctional Facility with other juveniles, where he will obtain his GED and other certificates. He explained that once he is 18, he will either move to Haida Prison or move to the Michigan Department of Corrections with adults. 
you went through all the programs and activities that Ethan will be able to participate in. The most important thing that Dr. Romanowski explained to us is what happens when a person gets a term of years. If your honor finds that the people have not met their burden and you hand down a sentence of a term of years, Ethan does not just walk out of those doors once he has served the minimum. Ethan has to prove himself. Ethan has to complete all of the available classes. He must attend therapy. He must not engage in assaultive behavior. He cannot receive tickets. He must show the parole board that he has changed, that he has been rehabilitated. If Ethan decides to spend the decades of his sentence assaulting inmates, racking up tickets, refusing to take advantage of the classes, he will not get out. He will continue to get flopped by the parole board and he will serve his maximum. This is a unique situation because this court doesn't have 15 or 30 years of records to look at. We can't show you on paper, look judge, he has been rehabilitated because he hasn't been to the Department of Corrections yet. I'm asking that you not penalize him for that fact that the law changed and we're doing this Miller hearing prior to the sentence. We ask that you give Ethan the chance to show this court and to show this community that he will do good things with his time. That when he stands before the parole board, there will only be positives to discuss. Denying the motion and giving him a term of years is not an automatic outdate. It is putting the ball in his court and it is letting someone else make the decision when they have those decades of records. Everyone can be rehabilitated, as Dr. Romanowski said, if they truly want it and they truly work at it. We believe that factor, Miller Factor 5, the possibility of rehabilitation, should be a mitigating factor because of the evidence that we presented. We then heard from Dr. Kadir. She has seen Ethan consistently in the beginning from the jail each day and then moved to each week. She has diagnosed him with major depressive disorder, recurrent episodes severe, and adjustment disorders with anxiety. These diagnoses are consistent with symptoms such as being hopeless, suicidal, having anxiety, hearing voices, seeing shadows, being unable to sleep, having nightmares, racing thoughts. All of these things Ethan reported and we can see through the text messages, the video, and the journal. We know that he attends and actively participates in his sessions. He talks through situations. He's taught coping skills, breathing techniques. Ethan is currently prescribed three medications for his mental health issues, and he has been taking them voluntarily and consistently since October. She explained what a PHQ-9 score is, told this court that originally Ethan scored in the moderately severe range and now mild. That shows improvement. She does not know the facts of this case. Her diagnosis is based off his ongoing symptoms and what she observed, and what she observed from the moment that he entered the jail. Her testimony goes to the fifth Miller factor, rehabilitation, because he is making progress. He is taking the necessary steps to treat his mental illness. If the prosecutor wants to argue that Ethan is not mentally ill, but simply carrying out this master plan because he is an evil person, does it make sense that when he would get to the jail, he would be depressed, suicidal, and anxious? No, he would be proud. He would be excited that he carried out his plan. And that's not what we see here. We heard from Dr. Keating, an expert in adolescent brain development. His research and studies are extremely complex, but he boiled them down for us. He explained how the adolescent brain is different than an adult. He addressed the first Miller, the fact, first factor in Miller, describing impulsiveness, immaturity, impetuosity, and the failure to appreciate risks and consequences. He explained hot cognition and what happens when adolescents, when an adolescent's thinking is highly influenced by their emotional state. He explained that an adolescent may not be able to get off a runaway train even after realizing it's headed for disaster. And I know Ms. McDonald addressed this. In my redirect of Dr. Keating, I asked, does the train ride have to be a short one or can someone get off and get back on and get back on and get back off and still be on a runaway train with the ability, not having the ability to get off of it? He agreed with me, yes. So I agree, it may have been a long train ride, but it was clear it was headed for disaster and Ethan was unable to get off. Planning, research, and premeditation does not change the research findings that he presented. 
He says that there are no scientific studies or empirical data that can conclude that an adolescent is irreparably corrupt. I ask you to focus on section seven of his paper, resilience. Two major processes have been found to promote resilience, social connection and mindfulness. The connections don't need to be within the immediate family. They can be teachers, mentors, doctors. Also, the normative brain changes of adolescents include a proliferation of new neural material and the rewriting of some critical neural circuitry. Even sick brain can be repaired. That goes directly to factor one and to factor five. We believe both of those factors should be mitigating. Finally, we heard from Dr. Colin King. He has spent 22 hours with Ethan. He has performed a litany of tests to confirm that Ethan currently has mental illness, that Ethan suffered from debilitating mental illness leading up to and on November 30th. His brain was on fire. That the journal, the text, the searches, the bird videos, the ramblings, they're all indicative of mental illness. That with proper intervention from school staff, counselors, and parents, this could have been stopped. That with continued therapy, medication, and a controlled environment with positive relationships, he can be rehabilitated. The prosecutor spent over four hours picking apart the report of Dr. King. The sentence form, the choice of words, what he didn't include, accused him of copying someone else's report, questioning his authority. But what they didn't spend a lot of time on is actually attacking his method of testing, the testing results, the graphs, and his actual findings. In their case in chief, they called no expert to refute the findings of Dr. King. No one came in here and told you he performed these 20 plus tests incorrectly, and here's why. They didn't like what Dr. King was saying, so instead of finding an expert to agree with them and their point of view, and come in to disprove his analysis, they attacked how he wrote the report. Now, Ms. McDonald said that they do not have the ability to have someone interview Ethan. I agree with that but they can definitely call an expert to review Dr. King's report and create a report based on what they believe or what was wrong with Dr. King's report, and that wasn't done. Finally, the people called Dr. Anneker as a rebuttal witness. She was brought in when, a, when we filed a notice of insanity defense and Ethan was referred for criminal responsibility. She examined him one time in March of last year. Her role was to evaluate him to determine if he was criminally responsible or if his mental illness rose to such a level that he was not criminally responsible. She wasn't his treating physician. She did not do any psychological testing herself, didn't have anyone else do it. We withdrew the insanity defense and Ethan pled guilty. I do not agree with her opinion that Ethan was not mentally ill and I don't think that the evidence that you have been presented with support that opinion. Nothing about her testimony or evaluation was about how he will be in the future. Nothing of what she testified to addresses any of the Miller factors. Now one thing I found interesting about her report was when she discussed that she believed that the voice in Ethan, Ethan's head was his conscience. I think that should go towards the first factor as further reason it should be Thank you for joining us for CBS News Detroit streaming at noon. Closing arguments happening now for the Oxford school shooter. Yeah, we're going to listen in, uh, but before we do, we will remind you once again that what you hear could be disturbing in nature. And their case is in front of a different judge, but the people cannot stand in this court and say Ethan does not have mental illness and then stand before Judge Matthews, the Court of Appeals, and now the Supreme Court and argue that he has mental illness and that he was mentally disturbed. Their court filings are full of statements and arguments that support their belief in that case that he has mental illness. I want to go over a few of those. Preliminary examination held in front of the Honorable Julie Nicholson, February 24th of 2022. These are the words of the prosecutor. Both Jennifer and James Crumbly knew that the evidence showed that their son was experiencing disturbing mental health issues in the months leading up to the shooting. 
found in their brief in support of the people's motion in limine to admit evidence. Their son was manifesting signs of mental distress, expressing those manifestations to the defendants and asking them for help. Filings in the Michigan Supreme Court. Those devices and social media search warrant returns produced evidence showing that defendant's son was displaying signs of being in crisis, reporting hallucinations, and asking for help. We have one set of facts here. You can't stand in two different courtrooms and argue two different things when it's one set of facts. I want to close by discussing the law that the court must follow when making this decision. The prosecutors have continuously argued that because this crime was premeditated through writings in his journal, internet searches, and his recorded video, that life without parole is automatically proportionate. That the crime was so heinous that their burden is met. I don't agree, and I don't believe the law agrees. All cases where a juvenile is facing life without parole are premeditated homicides. The worst of the worst cases. The courts in both People v. Skinner and People v. Bennett held that the fact that a vile offense occurred is not enough by itself to warrant the imposition of a life without parole sentence. They presented nothing else but facts. The law requires that we start with the presumption that life without parole is a disproportionate sentence. The people bear the burden to rebut that presumption by clear and convincing evidence. They must prove that Ethan Crumley is one of the rare, irreparably corrupt youths that cannot be rehabilitated. The court must look at the Miller factors to make that determination. In an unpublished opinion from just a few weeks ago, and I do have a, court, a copy for the court, People v. Paredes, the Michigan Court of Appeals upheld the finding in Taylor that Miller factors are mitigating and cannot be considered aggravating. Meaning, if a particular Miller factor does not mitigate against life without parole, at most, the factor has to be considered neutral. Our witnesses have touched on all of these factors, and we believe them all to be mitigating. Both sides spent an appreciable amount of time talking about mental illness, which in plain language is not stated in the Miller factors. The people asked Dr. King where he thought mental illness fits into the Miller factors. Well, People v. Bennett touches on that issue exactly. In that case, the defendant was also a youth who had a turbulent family history and untreated mental illness until he was incarcerated. The court held that treated mental illness is not a signal of irreparable corruption. Mental illness is universally recognized as a mitigating factor. The court held that the Eighth Amendment requires judges to view mental illness as a fact that mitigates an offender's culpability for committing a crime. Everything that has been presented here, whether it be in my exhibit binder or from the witnesses who came to testify, show that Ethan Crumbly suffered from untreated mental illness. The testimony of Ms. Gibson Marshall, the assistant principal, was very important. She said as she walked toward the student with a gun, she realized it was Ethan. She said, no way. It can't be Ethan. Ethan wouldn't do this. Your Honor, the same Ethan that Ms. Gibson Marshall knew is the same Ethan I've gotten to know. The person that you see in that video is not the person who sits beside me in this courtroom. The reason he didn't shoot Ms. Gibson Marshall, she called his name. She acted like she cared. He finally had someone who was caring about him. Lieutenant Willis in his testimony said that it was nearly impossible when he arrived at the school to set aside his emotions and do his job. His statements couldn't be more true. Same is true for Ethan's defense team, but we're here to do our job. And Your Honor, as you go and back and review everything that you have been presented with, we are asking that you set aside the emotions and you follow the law. We are asking that you deny the people's motion and sentence Ethan Crumbly to a term of years. Thank you.